Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are the co-owners of Avai University. Thanks so much for joining us for our Breaking Free from Codependency curriculum. We have another great class lined up for you today with Lori Gill. She's going to be talking with us about the role of attachment in relationships. Lori and I dive into many things, including what attachment theory is, the relationship with attachment and codependency, how childhood as well as adult trauma can influence the development of codependency, the importance of emotional regulation, and so much more. Enjoy the class, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Avaya's Breaking Free from Codependency Curriculum. I'm Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are teachers, mentors, and the co-owners of Avaya University. Avaya is the creator of over a 1,000 books, films, courses, teachings, and other supportive resources. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Our fellow teacher, Lori Gill, is here to talk with us today about the role of attachment on relationships. Lori is the founder and clinical director at the Attachment and Trauma Treatment Center for Healing. She's also a registered psychotherapist a certified trauma specialist, a trainer, consultant supervisor for the National Institute for Trauma and Loss in Children, and former psychology professor with over 18 years of experience working with children, youths, and adults in various settings. And Lori was also a featured teacher on Avaya University's Overcoming PTSD curriculum. Welcome back, Lori. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Andy. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I think this is such an important topic and, uh, and look forward to exploring it further. Yeah, thank you for saying yes to be here again. I, I really enjoyed our first conversation and obviously I think so much of codependency comes out of trauma. So um, our first conversation around PTSD then leading into a more of a, a relationships I think is, is perfect. So, so given that the title of your talk today is about attachment in relationships, can you talk a little bit about, about that and how does that weave into this topic of codependency? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, a great question. We know that as human beings, we're relational beings. We're born primed for um, attachment, attunement. Um, there was a time that this was thought to be kind of a luxury, right? You have food, shelter, water, you have everything you need. But we now actually know that healthy attachment relationships help to optimally grow our brain. They develop and entrain our nervous system to a state of regulation. Um, they help with the development of the parts of the brain that help us to notice our feelings um, and differentiate ourselves from others, learning how to relate to others throughout the lifespan um, and have relationships, and also how to regulate our emotions. So they're really actually critical. Um, and many times what I find in the work that I do with, um, with people who've experienced trauma and attachment trauma in particular, is there's this sense of shame around, you know, what's wrong with me? Like I jump from one unhealthy relationship to another and people are so, um, so aware of the pain and, and the shame that they're feeling around that. But really what they're doing is being human beings, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that attachment is an inborn human need, what they're doing is seeking out connection. Um, and, uh, and this is especially true when we haven't had that healthy foundation that has, you know, developed our nervous system to have tools and resources and supports and people in our lives, right? The absence of that um, just becomes that much more apparent. So people are actively seeking that. Um, and we know, you know, from a neurological perspective, I think it's important to touch on that intense emotions actually activate the brain and can wire it the same way as addictions. So when I have an exciting emotional relationship or I feel seen or I feel heard, there's um, a reward center in the brain and the limbic system, which ties in again with emotional um, regulation and, and feelings and affiliation that's activated and uh, it feels really good, right? And we can see the release of dopamine in that, you know, oxytocin. So this feels really, really good for our brain, our body, our nervous system. And then the absence of those relationships can bring about the anxiety, depression, loneliness, right? Pain. Um, and, uh, and so it can become a cycle, right? Where when we have the absence of those relationships, we have this tremendous pain and hurt and longing to connect. Um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily know what that healthy relationship looks like. And so you see people that 
uh, on both sides are actively seeking to connect, but they may not necessarily have that healthy template or foundation for how do we relate, right? What does a relationship look like? How is conflict resolved? How do we show intimacy? And that's where, you know, we, we see people coming together, but not necessarily having the tools and resources to know how to make that relationship work in a healthy way. Mm, got it. So do you have any strategies or tips or tools for people to learn to have a healthier relationship with, I would say, first and foremost, themselves, because I think that's a, a big issue. I think a lot of, that surrounds codependency, but also then, then building upon that, having a healthy relationship with others. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I think you're exactly right. The first thing that we need to do is to be able to focus on self, right? And to tend to ourselves, we need to know, you know, what we're feeling, we need to be able to be embodied. And that's really hard when we're experiencing trauma. Um, if we're in relationships where there is trauma, or there's been past trauma, or, you know, there's activation, it impacts that higher order kind of self reflective part of the brain. So we often work with people on kind of, identifying even who I am as a person, what I'm feeling, what I want, what I need, um, and doing some of that self-discovery work, which really spends some time figuring some of these out in conjunction with treating the trauma that, that is making it hard to, to stay in that self-reflective part of the brain. Um, but one of my favorite techniques and, and uh, tools that I like to use for, um, for both of these aspects actually is based on Dr. Laurel Ponell's um, resource installation. So she has a, a book, a great book called Tapping In. And what I often say to people is, can you envision, you know, the words, qualities, characteristics um, that you as yourself would like to have? right? So this can be kind of a present and future self, or it can be a future self, but and, and guiding them to think about like what words, qualities, characteristics would they like to have? And then we can use a form of bilateral stimulation, which really just helps with integration in the brain. So we've got that right brain emotional felt state, um, embodied our senses, and then we've got that left brain logic, meaning making, you know, that we're, we're using. And the meaning making is so important. And if the message over here is, you know, um, the messaging we've been receiving maybe from others in toxic relationships, like you're bad or unworthy or um, nobody will love you. That's what's being reinforced. And then we have the, the withdrawal of the affection and we feel the pain of that, right? So that's part of that cycle. So if we want to change that, part of it is also changing the messages that we're sending ourselves. So um, it's not to minimize what's happening, right? We want to acknowledge what is there. And this is where I often use that name it to tame it strategy that I think I mentioned before. So we're going to name, yes, you know, I have this pain. Um, we're going to name and acknowledge the trauma, but then redirect our focus onto the healing or where we want to be. And that really is from a neuroplasticity perspective, we're changing what we're focusing on, which is changing the way that the brain is responding and changing our behaviors. So um, a very simple technique, uh, it's not simple because it requires repetition and intentional practice, but uh, you can bilaterally tap, which is just right, left, right, left, okay? It doesn't have to be crossed over, it's just easier to demonstrate there. Many people prefer tapping on their legs, but you would think about those qualities, characteristics, traits that you would like to have, and then I would invite people to, you know, close their eyes and tap that in and see those qualities and characteristics in themselves. Um, Tara Brock has a beautiful future self meditation that goes nicely with this as well, that, uh, that pairs quite nicely. And the idea would be to practice seeing self the way that they would like to be in the future. Um, similarly, uh, we can do this with relationships, right? We can think of the qualities, characteristics, and traits of a healthy relationship or a desirable relationship. And I would typically write those out or map those out as well, and then use, the, again, the bilateral stimulation to tap that in. And what this does is it seems to bring it from up here in our thinking brain into our body. And when we're increasing the integration, it makes it so it's more readily available for us. Um, the other piece that I think is so important um, is meaning making. So uh, a great resource is Dan Siegel's book, Parenting from the Inside Out. 
Um, and I, I believe you've had him as a speaker before as well, which is wonderful. But the, the research is showing us from an attachment perspective, it's not so much what our attachment experiences were like that impact our later life relationships. That certainly does. But the greatest indicator is whether we have been able to form a meaning of our experiences. So can I tap into that emotional felt state of my experience and make sense of it at that left brain logical level? Now, naturally, this can be really charged work, so it's good to do with a therapist, but I find that that book, even if you're not a parent, is such a great resource for understanding how our relationships shape our brain and our nervous system, and also um, there's some great self-reflection exercises there that allow us to tune in to um, the impact these things have had on our life, and, and that allows us to consider how we may want to change things as well. Mm, got it. Yeah, I think I remember you talking about that la the Dan Siegel's book last time as well. Um, obviously, definitely worth worth checking out. It's not one of his that I've read. But um, so what about for people who are like currently in an unhealthy relationship? Let's say they're, they're struggling with codependency, as I think most people who are watching this are. Um, they're in some kind of toxic relationship dynamic. Um, any tips or strategies for them who are in it right now? Same kind of thing as what you just expressed or different or? Oh, that's a piece of it. That's a great question. You know, when we're in it, I think what's important to understand is the impact this has on the brain. And same thing, I have a lot of clients that I've worked with that have come out of intimate partner violence relationships. And they're like, what's wrong with me? How did I stay in this? How did I do this for so long? And I think what we need to come back to, and I won't describe it again because I did previously, but that hand brain model, right? So when we're flipping our lid, so when we know that when we're in these intense emotional states, whether it's verbal abuse or, you know, we've been conditioned to believe that we're not worthy or we're having affection and then it's taken away, all of this stuff impacts the way that our brain functions. And uh, when we're in, you know, toxic relationships, I liken it often to be like treading water, right? So it's like we're treading water and that higher order reflective thinking part of our brain is just not online. It can't be. We're just trying to stay afloat and, you know, walking on eggshells and trying not to cause more chaos, right? And get that love and affection that we so desperately need as human beings back. So I think part of it is understanding that one of the primary goals is how do I treat the, the stuff that's driving the activation, right? How do I treat the trauma? So even if people are in unhealthy relationships, doing therapeutic work that allows them to process the trauma of what happens or is happening is really important. That helps to reduce the arousal. Mindfulness and meditation also strengthen this prefrontal part of the brain, which um, gives us more of that higher order awareness and reflective function. So any activities that people can do that focus on emotional regulation or strengthening the prefrontal part of the brain, all of those are going to be tools and resources that we can use. Um, and, uh, and I think we're just trying to stay safe. Like you have a lot of people right now that are sheltering in place in violent relationships or unhealthy relationships and uh, things like finding a calm corner in your house, um, you know, noticing, trying to notice arousal activation when it's getting big and maybe trying to avoid um, engaging and, and going to a space in your home where you can just try to regulate until things settle. Um, a lot of the strategies that are recommended for people in these relationships right now are a bit different during this time. So I think, you know, the goal really is just staying safe as best as we can. Um, with clients, I also often explore all of the potential outcomes. So we'll look at, you know, what are the potential outcomes of, of being in this relationship? And often people would love the partners they're with to be able to change and have healthy relationships. And sometimes this just isn't possible without support and help. But I, I always will encourage people to connect with things with their heart and their gut. So look at the potential outcomes and try that on, not with the thinking part of your brain that's reasoning and rationalizing and, and justifying, but with your heart and your gut, feel it and notice, does this feel okay for me, right? Can I live with this? Um, the last question, you know, we'll look at different options like moving out, uh, living independently, staying in the relationship as it is, going for help, um, you know, staying in the relationship as it is now for the rest of your life. Um, and, and most people, when they feel that in their heart and their gut, they're like, oh, 
because that's not what they want, right? And, and if that's what's coming up, then I think it is linking up with a support in your area that can help you work through some of that, develop a safety plan, um, you know, heal some of the underlying trauma that's there and, and really figure out, you know, who you are and what your, your wants, needs, you know, goals, what are the things that nourish you? Right. Those are so important for, for our own healing. Um, yeah. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you also talking about it Rele- relevant to our times, um, the interesting times that we're in right now. And yes, many people I know are struggling um, in close quarters, let's call it, <laughs> as far as that goes. Um, so what about like, what would your definition of codependency be? Um, you know, I often actually stay away from labels, to be quite honest with you. Yes, and a lot of people do. <laughs> uh, we work with affect regulation, right? So we work with the nervous system and the brain. And, and as human beings, again, we're primed for connection. So I think what we're seeing is people who often, and not always, but who often haven't had those healthy attachment foundations, and they're seeking out connection to others, right? Um, and, and that's healthy, normal, optimal, right? It's more about how do I, how do I uh, have a sense of what I do want and you know, discern green flags from red flags so that I get a sense of when I'm meeting somebody, does this feel okay or does it not? Um, and, uh, and then doing our own healing work so that we, we do know what we want and, and know what emotionally regulates us. Um, in the moment. Got it. Awesome. So like for people who, one of the things that, that I come across a lot in exploring this topic is people struggling in losing their identity in relationships with other people. Um, do you have any suggestions there on how to, if people are getting into and it's not even just a romantic relationship, it could be friendships, it could be all sorts of things where people just, they lose themselves. They don't stand up for what they want or, um, they become a chameleon and, and all of a sudden all their likes are the same as this person's, that kind of thing. Do you have any, any thoughts around that about how to, how to navigate that? Yeah, so what you're describing is really common, actually following attachment, because quite often when there's there's early childhood trauma, and again, not always the case, but if we are not heard or we don't feel seen, or maybe it's not safe to be seen or be heard, then we do want to blend in, right? We do want to be pleasing. We do want to not cause trouble. And we, we so want to be liked and loved and cared for. Of course we do. So, but I think that's, again, coming back to, you know, that self-discovery work and and, and rewiring the brain to understand that regardless of our experiences, we have worth, right? And that's a big thing to take in when we've, we've learned otherwise. Um, but part of that worth is, is tuning into self and figuring out. And a lot of people following trauma don't have any clue who they are or what they like or what they want because they've not been able to, to do that work. Um, we actually have a Facebook group right now that really is for that purpose. Uh, it's a free group. We've set it up for COVID. Um, and it's all about this month's focus is on connecting to the body and the mind simultaneously. But we do like daily meditations and mindfulness exercises. And we bring on guest speakers like gardening, maybe, or painting or um, coffee hour chats to give people the opportunity to try some of these different things and see what do I like, right? What does bring me joy? If we're sheltering in place, how do we, you know, um, be mindful about what we're filling our time with? So we can binge watch Netflix, and I get it, and I've been there. Um, but also, can we watch something that teaches us maybe some emotional regulation skills, or teaches us how to connect with self, right? Or finding out what we what we do that nourishes us and fills us back up. Um, and again, you know, Laurel Parnell's book, um, Tapping In, is a great resource for helping people figure out what some of those resources are that maybe are lacking in their life and, and creating, because our brain doesn't differentiate between us experiencing and, and having somebody physically with us in comparison to visualizing. So I can actually tap in what I need or want to have happen. Um, and I see this have such a profound impact. It doesn't change what is, but it's, there's something validating about that that just um, is very healing and restorative. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. So speaking of validating, I know another thing a lot of people <clears throat> struggle with is 
trying to get validation and approval from outside of themselves. And um, in this topic of codependency, that's a common, common trait. So any thoughts on, obviously, we need to have healthy connection, but at the same time, if we can't be validating ourselves and, and, and I guess, approving of ourselves so that we're not always looking for it outside, it can be really unhealthy in my experience. So any thoughts on how people can learn how to do that, learn how to approve of themselves so they don't have to get it outside of them? Yeah, yeah, great question, Andy. Again, a lot of that involves that higher order self-reflective function, right? Um, but we, what we see quite often is um, people reach out to others, right, um, for love, affiliation, support, you know, affirmation, whatever, and that person responds exactly the way that they know that they do, and we're so hurt by it, right, because that's not what we deeply need. And, uh, and oftentimes, I've, I've found even just saying to clients, you know, instead of reaching out to this person and expecting that they're going to behave the way that you need and want, can you try to help your brain understand that either they won't or they can't? and quite often it's just that they can't they don't have those tools um, to know how to respond maybe the way that I need and want them to and when we shift the expectation because I can't control others I can't control their behaviors but I can control the impact I let I, it have on me and the meaning I form right so if instead I say you know what um, I need and want this person to behave this way I'm naming it for myself I'm validating it but I know that they can't or they won't so I'm not anticipating anymore that they're going to do that that seems to help um, shift the dynamics and interestingly um, it, it changes the relational dynamics when we expect things differently, right? So if I'm just saying, you know what, I know that they can't or won't be supportive because that's their personality or, you know, their, their history, um, then it's looking at how can I fill that, right? How can I fill that for myself? And again, it could be, you know, I need and want my, my father to be responsive and loving to me. Right. So that's where if I were working with somebody, I might say, would you like to imagine that? Right. What that might look like either with them or, you know, uh, Laurel talks about an ideal father where we look at the qualities, characteristics, right, of an ideal father and tapping that in. And I know it sounds funny. But unless you've experienced it, like I see the profound healing that happens for people when they're able to do this, because all of a sudden, instead of, you know, having somebody respond in a way that's so hurtful and disconfirming, I'm able to receive and embody what I really need and want, right? And even though it's not maybe what's actually happening, the brain's not differentiating that. So it, it can be so incredibly reparative. Mm, beautiful. Awesome. Thank you. So here's, here's another question that comes up a lot. Um, catastrophic thinking. This is something that I myself have struggled with, and I think it's it's important for people to have some kind of practice or some kind of way to get out of that mindset, because that seems to be something that comes up probably based on, I guess, childhood trauma and things like that, where our minds go into what's wrong, okay, what hyper arousal, right? What could be wrong with this relationship or or myself or something like that? So, any thoughts on how to how to navigate being in like obsessive, catastrophic, like negative thinking? Yeah, so what you're talking about really is like the amygdala, right? That's constantly scanning for threat and on, on. Um, and, uh, and that's a big part of the work that we do. We actually do a new amygdala message as part of our integrative trauma and attachment treatment model. But um, I think part of it, again, comes back to how do we reduce the arousal, right? So treating the trauma really helps with that, that big um, kind of arousal activation where we're constantly scanning and seeing things. We also recognize that that window of tolerance becomes smaller and smaller with trauma, right? So it makes it so that we're, we're having bigger reactions to things that perhaps were proportionate to what happened in the past, but might not match. And sometimes they do. But often the clients that I'm working with, you know, we're responding in ways that are more relevant to kind of what happened in the past and, and more proportionate to what happened in the past than perhaps what's happening now. So part of the work becomes looking at, you know, is, is there actual threat now? And sometimes there is. And if there is, that's different. Then we want to look at safety and emotional regulation skills and reducing further harm as best as we can in that moment. But if it's a false alarm where the past is triggering something in the present, then we want to be able to discern that, right? And really look at, okay, um, where's the evidence, right? So if I'm feeling unsafe in this moment, just kind of explain 
exploring. Is, is there stuff that's happening that's contributing to this? Um, are there cues, you know, and if so, like I said, responding appropriately to keep yourself safe as best as possible. But if it's a false alarm, that's where we want to look at those amygdala messages. So maybe it's reframing, right? Um, and again, I often use name it to tame it, but it might be looking at, so even though at the time this happened, I felt, you know, like I was going to die or I felt terrified or I felt really um, alone. I now know that. And then you would have them fill in the blanks with, you know, whatever is true about their current circumstances. Um, you know, I, I did survive that or um, that I'm safe in this moment or I have people who care about me, um, whatever that is that feels true and, and redirecting the focus there. Um, and then also leaning into resources that, that help to support them and their healing. Got it. Awesome. I love, especially the part where you said, where's the evidence? That's such a great, great question to ask. <laughs> yeah. And I look at sensory stuff, right? It's always great to, because, you know, the thinking part of the brain sees things a little bit differently, but the sensory part of our brain is where trauma is stored. Um, it's quick. It assesses things really quickly. So if we tune into the environment around us and really can take that in with our senses, there's a lot that we can glean, a lot of insights we can gain. Mm, got it. How about like the art of feeling our feelings? I know I'm kind of jumping around in a lot of different topics here, but, but that seems to be another thing that people struggle with um, a lot of times with childhood traumas and um, relationship struggles is, the, I guess, the ability to feel feelings as opposed to feel numb or just feel like states of fear and anxiety. So you have any, any thoughts there? Well, that's a highly protective, adaptive um, function that we have, right? Like that, the, the ability to dissociate, there's so many things that our brain does for us to protect us that really are quite marvelous, right? Because it allows us to escape these unescapable experiences, um, you know, and, and is needed at the time. The problem is, is when it becomes ongoing. But I think that, um, you know, not being able to feel our feelings is very adaptive when we're in experiences where doing so would be tremendously painful. When um, we're wanting to kind of increase that embodied awareness, right, for healing purposes, uh, there are lots of great activities. So the DBT style techniques are great. Anything sensory based, right? So focusing on our senses. Um, when we introduce people to meditations and mindfulness, we do so from the basis of present moment awareness. And we're typically starting with awareness of your surroundings, awareness of your senses, awareness of breath. So all of this kind of more sensory stuff is really great for helping us reconnect to the body. Art, play, body movement, um, singing, dancing, right, drumming. There's a lot of this stuff that's very prosodic, but it also works with the nervous system, helps to regulate the vagus nerve. Um, so yeah, anything kind of sensory is great. Um, for down regulating it, but also for helping us to connect to our body in a safe way and do it in small doses, right? I think that's the key is that if you're coming from, well, and again, the trauma processing is so critical because I don't want to teach somebody to be in their body and feel their feelings if they're just going to be going back into those intense terrifying experiences, right? But when, we, when we're processing the trauma and reducing that arousal, being in the body is no longer such a threat, right? But we're doing it in little bits. So I'm not starting with a, an hour long meditation. I'm starting with something that's maybe three breaths, right? Um, and just noticing that flow of the breath in and out fluidly like the ocean. Um, or maybe I'm starting with taking in the environment with my senses, but small, small doses and giving self permission. Um, people will often think, well, if I can't hold attention to this, or I can't remain grounded um, for more than a couple of seconds, then I'm not doing it right. And every little bit counts. When I'm doing this work with people, I want to see, can I shift their affective state for one to two seconds in this moment, right? That's the key. So when there's intense emotions or when I'm, you know, trying to get into my body, can I do it even for one to two seconds, right? Can I go to a relaxation place and take in all of those elements of, you know, this space that's soothing and calming for me? And can I feel that even just for a moment? Because when we do that, we're shifting that affective state and we're connecting to the body. Mm, beautiful. So you've mentioned this like throughout this conversation, how important trauma, like healing the trauma actually is, you know, above everything we're talking about. So 
if people watching right now obviously have had some kinds of trauma, um, whether it's a single event or, you know, CPTSD or something that ongoingly, um, where do you suggest that they get started in, in helping heal that trauma? Yeah, I think working with somebody who does sensory-based work is really critical. So with trauma, we know that it's stored more in that sensory part of the brain, brain scans, neuroimaging, uh, Ruth Lanius's work and colleagues show us that right hemisphere, when we're calling trauma, is very busy and active at work. Left hemisphere has less activity, little to no activity. Our speech center is largely offline. So this is where, um, you know, although I think CBT is great and cognitive, you know, talk therapy can be really great, when we're doing trauma work, we really want to be weaving in the sensory and the embodied pieces. Um, you know, attachment focused EMDR is great. We have an integrative trauma and attachment treatment model that we train people around the world in. Um, and that I can recommend because I know it. Um, but you know, anything like I think questions for people would be if you're going to somebody for trauma specific work, what kind of therapy is it? You know, how do they incorporate the body into it? How do they incorporate the breath, you know, mindfulness, um, sensory processing, right? Whether it's a somatic experiencing or sensory motor, there's lots of great approaches out there. Um, but I think when we're initially starting, we want to start with the bottom up. Right? We're working with the body and the nervous system, because if this part of our brain keeps flipping offline because there's big arousal activation, until we can reduce the arousal, that's when the cognitive reframing and you know, the, the higher order kind of strengthening and training becomes really, really important. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would just say, be curious, ask questions, don't hesitate if you're reaching out to somebody to ask, you know, what does trauma processing look like at your center or, you know, with you and, uh, and see how they explain that. And you should be looking for, I, I, I find it's most effective anyways, when there's the sensory um, elements there. Mm, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Um, so I want to make sure you get a chance to talk about a program you have for everybody, as well as any other resources that um, you'd like to point people to before we wrap up. So what do you have? Yeah, wonderful. So um, we do, as I mentioned, have a trauma attachment certification program. And um, the first day of the training, and, and even the second really, is open to anybody who would like to learn more about trauma. Um, it takes you through the foundations of trauma and attachment dysregulation through that neurological and physiological perspective, but at a user-friendly way, where you can kind of understand the impact trauma has on the brain and the nervous system. The second day is more so looking at um, phase-based applications that we can use to treat trauma. So teaching some of those grounding, but also giving an introduction to some of the different processing things that are working, and also some of those competency building pieces of, you know, figuring out who I am, self-discovery, and, uh, and creating new neural pathways based on, you know, what it is that I'm looking to accomplish. So you can learn more about that on our website, which is www.attch.org. Um, two other resources that I'd really like to mention, and I talked about one already, um, and I'm just gonna pull it up to make sure I say this right. Mm -hmm. So we have um, our Facebook group. This is started through our nonprofit, and it's attached, so A-T-T-C-H Niagara, Caring Connected Communities. Um, the, the web link is long, so I won't say that, but uh, you can find it. And it's open to anybody who's looking to um, reduce stress, build new skills, uh, connect with others. We know people are so isolated right now. Um, that's a great resource. And then I also sit on um, an international committee that's through uh, the American uh, Psychological Association. And it's a task force specifically for COVID. Um, and we've created a Facebook group um, called COVID IPV. So on Facebook, Instagram as well for each of these resources, but, but Facebook is the more active platform. So it's uh, COVID and then the separate word of IPV. And there are resources, videos, tools, and we're starting a series of talks just to help people with interpersonal violence. The, the main focus is intimate partner violence, but we've broadened it because there's so much hurting that's happening around the world right now. So those are just some free resources that are a great spot. And if you're looking for more emotional regulation tips, I have tons of little short videos on my YouTube channel. Um, and again, that's Attachment and Trauma Treatment Center for Healing. And they're just, they're short, but tools that you can practice that are effective and, and practical. 
Awesome. Thank you. And everybody watching, we do have, we have links below to all of that. So, so you can just click through on those to the Facebook groups, YouTube channel, as well as your program and check all those things out. Are there any last insights before we wrap up? No, I'm just grateful to be here. And I think, you know, um, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that we have so much hurting in life. But what I think we really want to emphasize is that as human beings, we also have tremendous capacity to heal and rediscover self and, you know, uh, recreate self even throughout the lifespan. And, uh, and that I think is very hopeful. So I love the work that you're doing and, and the hope that you're spreading. Mm, thank you. Right back at you, Lori. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> thank you. And thank you everyone who's tuning in, watching or listening right now for showing up for yourself. That's the first step is to show up for yourself. So we're so excited you're here and doing that for yourself and we'll see you again real soon. Take care. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to this latest class with Lori Gill. She talked with us about the role of attachment in relationships. I really enjoyed this conversation with Lori. Lori was featured in our Overcoming PTSD curriculum. And if you have not watched her class in that curriculum, I highly recommend it because she is an expert in this field of trauma as she talked about many times throughout this conversation. So if that's something that you struggle with, I highly recommend you check that out as well. And I really love just how she, she related, obviously attachment, as well as childhood and adult trauma into this topic of codependency and why is it that we develop these coping mechanisms that bundle into this title called codependency and you know really where where it stems from and I think anytime that we go back into the past and start to really un unfold and um, understand better what things happen to us, what kind of environment we were raised in, et cetera. It helps us be more compassionate with, with ourselves today. At least that's, that is my experience. So I really love that Lori went into depth about how to regulate your nervous system. Obviously this is extremely important, regulating our nervous system, system learning how to self-regulate, learning how when we are in, let's say emotional turmoil, or we are in catastrophic things, Thinking, or we are in some, you know, significant state of mind or um, emotional state that is leaving us in massive fear or anxiety, those kinds of things, that we're able to regulate that, that we're able to take some deep breaths, that we're able to do tapping, that we're able to do things like somatic experiencing, we're able to get back into the body, reorient with our surroundings, presence ourselves to the present moment, all those kinds of things. So she went through many different ways that we could do this and um, showed you many different systems that you could use to apply this in your life. And one last thing I wanted to mention was when we talked about catastrophic thinking. And I see this uh, very commonly in people who struggle with codependency, people who get kind of trapped, so to speak, in this experience of thinking the worst thing is going to happen, like the, the, the world will implode kind of thinking. And it sounds kind of silly to say that, but that is, that is the experience for so many people, myself included, when I really get wrapped up into that kind of thinking. So do you find yourself catastrophizing in, do you find yourself, maybe you're just driving down the road and it's a beautiful sunny day, but in your mind, you're in chaos, you're in catastrophe, you're in, oh my God, what could possibly happen? Worrying about what's going to happen in your future. And one of the things that Lori said that I think is just so simple, such a simple um, reframing is to ask yourself the question, where's the evidence for that? Is, is this actually happening right now? Or am I actually pulling from some past experience? Maybe if you have fears of abandonment, you're catastrophizing about the future, about being left by somebody, by everybody in your life, those kinds of things. Where is that coming from? Where is the evidence right now that that is going to happen? If currently you're looking around you and there's no evidence that that is currently happening, then chances are you are pulling from past experience, past trauma, and bringing that into your present. So just, you know, it, even if it's as simple as taking a breath when you recognize it and name it to tame it, like she said, when you recognize that catastrophic thinking and ask yourself, where's the evidence for that? At least for me, I find that so helpful to really just like flip the switch and get myself out of that mindset and catch myself in that moment. So highly recommend that you try that out if that's something that resonates with you as well. Thank you again so much for tuning in and we'll see you again real soon. Take care, everybody.